So our next piece on the Northern Renaissance uh, timeline is from the High Northern Renaissance, and that would be the 16th century, so early 1500s here with this piece. It is called the Isenheim Altarpiece, and its artist in terms of painting is Mat uh, Matthias Grunewald, and the sculptor of the interior portion is Nicholas of Hagenau. Uh, really, Grunewald is the name to ultimately make sure you know, because he is the painter of multiple levels of this. And then I'll show you the interior sculpture by Hagenau, and that's at the most interior level of the altarpiece. It's a really complex piece in terms of structure and how it's put together, um, but I don't think the the paintings there are complex for you to know. It's just an amazingly intricate piece. So going to context, you would find this piece at a hospital and the Isenheim Hospital to be specific. And it was a hospital built and run by monks who were devoting themselves to care for those people who were sick and dying of a particular disease more often than not called St. Anthony's Fire. Now St. Anthony, is the patron saint of suffering of skin disease. And St. Anthony's fire was a particular skin disease that was caused by eating bread that had an infected yeast to it. And that yeast would cause your skin to break out in sores, you would have hallucinations, and ultimately, more likely than not, it would result in your death. And in fact, the LSD, the drug LSD, which causes hallucinations, uh, is uh, like a component of this yeast. So that is what St. Anthony's fire is. So in terms of vocabulary, I would definitely like you to know that, that disease, that term. And in the hospital then, they wanted an art piece to be seen and to comfort those who are sick and to comfort their families as well. And it's a pretty dramatic art piece. It might not seem too great in terms of uh, looking at this and go, oh, I feel better now. It, it's, it's more complex than that. And I just wanted you to see it before I give you this statement and you know, know that seeing Jesus here on the cross and seeing him physically suffer, and then seeing his mother and Mary Magdalene and others emotionally suffer, it's, it's meant to, and I'm looking at the, the last thing on this slide, it's meant to make you think, you know, what is my suffering compared to Jesus' suffering, compared to Mary Magdalene and the Virgin Mary's emotional suffering? So very similar, hopefully in your head you're going, oh, that's very similar to the Rotgen Pieta, and you're right. Uh, so that's definitely going to be a related piece from that later Gothic, you know, um, later medieval era that we've already studied. So let's take this layer by layer. And in fact, there are multiple layers to this art piece, really three in total. So this is the closed altarpiece. And it is a nighttime crucifixion scene. And in the center, you have Christ. And it is probably the most realistic image of a crucifixion that you see in art history because his shoulders twist you know, to the point where they're probably dislocated. Uh, his waist is very thin as his body hangs and elongates. It's going to compress your lungs and cause you to be unable to breathe. And in fact, on a, on a cross in a crucifixion scene, you are going to die from suffocation. And so that kind of gives you that real sense of that. And then what is most telling and most realistic of a detail is that horizontal beam in the cross is bending with the weight of Jesus. You know, an adult 37 year old male hanging on that is going to impact them that wood beam. And so that attention to detail and the difference of how the crucifixion is seen, whereas in the Middle Ages, Christ was kind of floating on the cross and he, his body looked perfectly healthy and ideal. It was this 
sanitation of the scene early on, here's where you really see it come to its realistic, you know, visual. Now on the right panel, you have a guy who's being stuck with many different arrows and that's Saint Sebastian and he's what's known as the plague saint. So it makes sense then here that you have this plague saint being uh, portrayed for an, a disease that is plague-like. And on the left-hand panel, you have Saint Anthony. He is again our saint of these skin diseases and for whom the disease is named, Saint Anthony's fire. I have a new vocab term for you, and it has to do with the lower panel that I'm pointing to. And the term is predella, and it's a painting or a sculpture on the front, so on the front surface of a raised shelf. Um, and it's basically this ledge or a shelf on which an altarpiece sits. So the predella itself is going to be above the altar, and it's a shelf or a ledge on which the altarpiece or the painting or sculpture that you're portray you know, portraying, it's what that rests upon. So again, a predella, a painting or a sculpture that sits above the altarpiece, and it functions as a ledge or a shelf that the altarpiece actually rests upon. And so on that predella, we have a painting of really the lamentation, where you have the tomb open, you have Christ's body, and you have the mourners around him, uh, again, showing their sadness and their despair at his loss. Now, there's so much going on in this, so I wanted to keep with the first uh, closed panel still. And I'm looking at the center panel here, and you have John the Baptist, who is on our right. So the, when we're looking at this image, he's to the right of Jesus, our right at least, right next to the lamb. And he's pointing to Christ, and there's writing, and I'll show you a close-up later. And the writing basically says, he must increase, but I must decrease. And it's a lesson to us as humans of humility to not be so centered on our pain, our suffering, our experiences, our situations. It's to, to surrender basically to something that is higher than ourselves. And in this case, in this Christian art piece, it would be Christ, God, Christianity, and so on. Um, I talked about that Christ's body shows more suffering and the realism of crucifixion than ever before. And also you have the North continues its focus on symbolism with the sacrificial lamb and holding a cross and spilling blood into a goblet uh, at the foot of Jesus. That is a symbol of Christ as the sacrificial lamb. And on the left hand side, you have Mary Magdalene on her knees uh, looking up to Jesus and you have the Virgin Mary being comforted. Uh, I think it's John the Evangelist there uh, comforting her in this scene. So, you know, the light illumination is really interesting. This nighttime crucifixion scene is really interesting. Again, meant to be looked upon by the patients to remember the, the bigger picture to decrease themselves and their suffering and to increase their faith and their re reliance on Christianity, that there is a larger purpose. And that would be you know, providing comfort to them. Now, if you open up this piece, you have the second, the, one of the inner levels, level one, so this image is quite different and just looking at it, all the light, the warmth, the comfort, except you know, the predella is still there with the lamentation. But if we're just looking at the three panels above the predella, on the um, left hand side, you have the Annunciation with the angel Gabriel, who is telling the Virgin Mary she will be pregnant with the Son of God. In the center, you have the nativity scene. And nativity, since we really haven't spoken about that, uh, it can be a new vocab term with meaning the birth of Christ. So you have the Virgin Mary holding Jesus, 
the angel choir of angels are playing and singing at this birth and it is um, quite a lovely you know comforting nurturing mother-son scene and then on the right you have the resurrection but it's combined really with an ascension scene as well and Christ kind of transfiguring and changing to his more spiritual presence as he kind of floats in the air above with this grand light all around him. It's really quite something and uh, more supernatural and divine than I think ever we've seen Christ being depicted, at least so far in the pieces we've done. Now in the Northern Renaissance, you're always gonna have these medieval influences. So in the panel on the left with the Annunciation, since it's in a room, you can look up at the vault or the ceiling and see a groin vault. You can look at the back windows in that space and see pointed arches. Those are very much medieval characteristics, Gothic influences. Our figures are distorted, which is a much more Northern Renaissance ideal than an Italian Renaissance ideal Italian Renaissance are gonna go for naturalism of bodies, um, much more than they do in the North. You have these stories taking place in landscapes that are more Northern, forests, mountainous, definitely not landscapes that these stories would have occurred in reality. So that is also a, a typical characteristic of Northern Renaissance painting here symbols, putting the stories into their own um, settings and medieval influences, especially in the architecture, if there is architecture to be seen. Now you can open the panel one more time. And this is the, the last level of when you've opened it. This is the second time you've opened it. This is where the sculptural pieces come into play. And so on our left-hand panel, you have St. Anthony, who's dressed in blue, visited by um, St. Paul, who is known as the first hermit of the desert. Now, St. Anthony thought he was the first hermit. So for him, it is a lesson in humility. Again, lessons of humility. And the setting looks otherworldly. It looks a bit off-putting and a little bit frightening. And then if you go over to the right, even more so, uh, St. Anthony is there being tormented by demons. The demons, I imagine, are meant to convey uh, plagues, those monsters who are otherworldly, the, the temptations, the sicknesses, everything challenging, I would imagine, that makes you question your faith uh, and question, you know, what is this all for? So that panel is really frightening, and I'm gonna show you that up close in a minute. And then in the center, you have the sculpture by Nicholas of Hagano, showing St. Anthony in the center, with St. Jerome and Augustine on either side, and we're not gonna really go into those two figures. But I wanted to show you the medieval characteristics up on above St. Anthony, who again is in the center, the intertwining plants that kind of Going back to the illuminated manuscripts or the fibulas we saw in the Middle Ages, that same intertwining and plant design you see here. Um, and then Christ and the Apostles, in a very Renaissance way, very you know, mathematically balanced Christ in the center and then four groupings of three uh, Apostles on either side. That is a very classical presentation through sculpture work in the predella. So you open up that lamentation scene and then you have Christ and his apostles in these little niches that are sculpted. And then here are just some close-ups for you uh, to see the close-ups of the wounds. It's a pretty gruesome scene. Uh, you can see a close-up of Mary Magdalene so you can see the detail and also her face. See a little bit of the writing with John the Baptist there with, you know, I must decrease and you must increase. There is he points to Jesus uh, and his body. And then uh, again, some other close-ups there so you can just see some of the detail 
a little bit better than what you've seen so far. I think, oh, there is a close up of some of the demons with St. Anthony. And on the left, the lower left hand corner, that kind of swollen belly, it almost looks like Gollum from Lord of the Rings, but the greenish skin, the swollen kind of reddish inflamed body, that is supposed to be a personification of St. Anthony's fire. So, you know, the disease comes to life. So um, function and formal qualities. Now I'm thinking also there's a vocab term I need to tell you uh, that I will do though when we get together in class called a polyptic, poly, you know, polyptic. We've done a, tri, uh, a triglyph before, but this is uh, a polyptic. So we'll do that together, a many paneled art piece but I will go over that with you in class. This uh, altarpiece definitely for function is religious. And then I would say for formal qualities, form with the three panels, an interesting and a unique form that we've done. Also color to suggest you know, warmth and otherworldliness, that vivid color, especially in the interior. Uh, to convey an emotional state of being. I would also say form too, I forgot to tell you this, when you, you can open this predella, it opens in the center and it looks like Christ's legs and as a result is being amputated, which was something that would happen quite often when you were suffering St. Anthony's fire. So form, you know, and the, how the story progresses and how the pieces open to kind of aid the story and aid this kind of you know, experience as with the legs being amputated there, I think form is a great formal quality that you could use. All right, so that is the Isenheim altarpiece, the really interesting multifaceted uh, piece by Grunewald.